begin uh, this event, I want to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Welcome everyone to the first and hope many high school insights with alumni and friends around issues that affect the information field. I also want to mention that we will have a little bit of time at the end uh, of Lisa's presentations for you to ask questions. So uh, before, uh, uh, so I just wanted to let you know that you have that opportunity. Now, uh, I have to say, I never knew I could be saying that uh, we have a pandemic of catastrophe, uh, of pandemic proportions and actually be living through one. And why am I saying this? Uh, this is because we are in the middle of a pandemic and many of us and our, and our organizations have been forced to change our models of branding. And while it has been a painful transition, it might also be an opportunity for innovation. Uh, what are the opportunities this pandemic has opened uh, when some have been closed? And I feel that you will be delighted uh, uh, about the way Liz has found ways to make organizations stand out. I recently met Liz and I felt that I have known her for years. She's scary, knowledgeable, and I have tremendous experiences. She has helped leaders in many organizations to share their stories and the mechanisms to increase their impact and uh, uh, potential. Uh, she has a long career as entrepreneur who has helped many non-for-profits through her consulting film, film, firm, which is one of only four Nelson Mandela endorsed organizations. She is also an invited uh, member to the U.S. Speaker Program of the Department of State, and she has shared her expertise through her trainings to many organizations worldwide. So thank you everyone for joining us. And without further ado, uh, help me uh, uh, welcoming Liz and Gozi. Go ahead, Liz. Thank you so much, Marta. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful to um, SU, to iSchool for uh, making this opportunity possible. Um, I'm thrilled to be back, even though I'm not physically back. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be able to address an audience made up of our community. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and go into my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I want to go ahead, just let me know if you can see the presentation. Okay, great. Let me just minimize the year, everybody else. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about Tech for Good, how to leverage your digital skills to facilitate social impact. Um, I'm Liz Ngonzi and I graduated in the, cl in the class of 1992 from what was then, now it's the iSchool, but then it was the School of Information Studies. Um, and uh, a funny fact is I actually went to Eunice, I mean, I went to Syracuse as um, an art student. So I was, a, I was in VPA and it was through a bunch of different um, sort of relationships that I discovered the um, School of Information Studies and I never went back. Um, and so I'm really thrilled that I had the opportunity to go through the program. I'm going to first talk, tell you a little bit about how I'm currently creating, um, you know, impact with my digital skills. So um, I have a consulting firm um, through which I provide coaching, executive coaching and speaking services uh, to nonprofits as well as impact led um, either entrepreneurs or executives uh, and really helping them to craft their stories in a way that enables them to most effectively engage with their various stakeholders. Um, to be able to access opportunities um, and to be able to grow their businesses. And, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about storytelling. So it's storytelling in general, but it's also digital storytelling. As you know, we're living in a virtual world right now, effectively. So uh, being able to convey what you're doing and what you're about and what's unique about what you have to offer online is very, very critical. I also recently in, um, founded the International Social Impact Institute, uh, which is an entity of its own, but I'm partnering with different academic partners to develop courses and, um, and, and as well as provide consulting services and training to not only traditional nonprofits, but to social enterprises, foundations, um, and, and the like, um, really addressing some of the challenges that they're going through right now with a great emphasis on, you know, increasing digital skills, um, accessing, um, you know, 
funders and, and the like through uh, digital platforms, um, as well as really um, becoming very clear about the importance of really connecting or, or diversifying the sector so that you're really getting new voices and the potential to innovate much more greatly by doing so. I'm going to tell you a little bit my story. For those of you who are in the iSchool physically, this is this was taken in the iSchool a few years ago, uh, and I love this photograph because it, it's, it's, it was part of the It Girl, the It Girls uh, program it's at, at the high school that I love very much. Um, I won't go into great detail about it, but it basically is a program that's designed to provide high school girls with an opportunity to learn about um, you know, the, the, the careers within the, the tech sector um, and how they can really advance. And, I, and so this was taken at high school and I love it. Anyway, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story very, very briefly. It's been a 25 year journey, but let's go ahead and see what I can get through right now. So my journey starting from Syracuse to corporate America starts you know, when I graduated in the second class, um, IST class in 1992. On the left is a photograph with, with my very, very, very dear and departed um, mentor, Marta Dosa. In fact, she's the one who really introduced me to what, you know, when we talk about the internet, it wasn't like anything like you see right now. There's no user, into, you know, uh, graphic user interface or anything, but she, I did a lot of research with her. And so that really was very, very fundamental to my ability to um, really uh, create a lot of impact through my digital skills. So wanted to recognize her. Um, soon after that, um, I want to also mention because many we're going through this pandemic and we're also in a recession. What's really important is I graduated in a recession and I would to tell you that the majority of my friends who were in other programs at SU were not able to get um, jobs at that time. In fact, many of them ended up having to take waiting, to, they needed to, they had to take jobs like waiting tables and so on and so forth. But I had five job offers because of the program I was coming out of. Um, and I subsequently chose to go with Digital Equipment Corporation, which at the time was the number two company, um, 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 computer company in the world. It's now morphed into, I believe, um, Hewlett Packard. So I was a marketing specialist. And what's really important about that is that I actually hated programming. And so I was, I remember Susan Bonzi was my, my, my professor. And I said to her, I said, look, I really don't like programming. I have a job where I'm in marketing. I don't really want to do this course. But anyway, um, I made it through. Um, and what was really important about the program for me was that I was able to take my understanding of technology, my understanding of how information is flows through in comp through companies to apply it to this company that, you know, was really at the forefront of technology in a marketing capacity. Subsequent to that, I went to go work as a sales executive for a smaller company, Microsystems Inc., um, that sold technology to the hospitality industry. And so you can see these 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 are point of sale systems. If you see them today, they're touch screen. They're very flat, very 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 sleek. But that's what we had to work with at the time. Um, and then um, I then went to Cornell uh, to, to get an MBA focus in hospitality at the hotel school, and subsequently left there to go work for Arthur Anderson which is no longer, um, but I was a manager there and I worked on lots of different projects. A very important thing about this is that I was hired to help build a hospitality practice, but um, I was hired maybe the, the fall before I started, um, and I started the, the subsequent um, fall, and um, the partner who had hired me actually left. And so all of a sudden they needed to find a new place for me. But what helped me is that I had a tech background. I had um, these digital skills. So I was able to be integ integrated into the telecommunications, media and entertainment practice. And I did a little bit of hospitality work. So that's really important that the, the again, the degree really came in handy for me. Fast forward to 2001 to 2018. Um, I, it's, you know, that's my entrepreneurial journey. And so um, I had a consulting firm that eventually really focused on helping nonprofits, um, both here in the US and as well as internationally to uh, raise funds and to, you know, rebrand and, and, and to brand themselves uh, with a special emphasis on, um, you know, digital branding. We didn't call it that and I didn't think of it that way, but that's what we did. And so this, this first one is a screen grab, a screenshot of an online auction that we introduced for um, an organization called Susan G. Komen for the Cure that's in involved in breast cancer research. And it was for their pink tie ball. We were hired to rebrand the, 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 their event, which is a you know, multi-million dollar event. Um, and I said to them, we've got to go digital. So one of the things we incorporated was an online auction, which is very, very, very common now. But this was back in 2007, where you really didn't have that. 
Um, and so that was really a great advantage for us bringing, being able to deliver those kinds of services uh, to nonprofits they didn't have, they didn't previously have. Fast forward to 2013, um, we um, were, we secured a contract with Cornell University's um, School of Hotel Administration um, as for their, their major fundraiser, which is the Icon and Innovator Awards. And we provided marketing and fundraising strategy. And this is actually, um, a screenshot of um, an app that we introduced in the for the event so that there could be a lot more interactivity during the event leading up to the event um, and so that's just an example of how we integrated that sort of digital element into a fundraising event that raises millions of dollars in scholarships for um, the school um, in 2014, I was hired by um, Africa Tikkun, which is an organization based in South Africa and has the distinction of being one of only four nonprofits in the world for which Nelson Mandela served um, as chief patron. It's a Nelson Mandela endorsed organization. And my job was to build its presence in the US to be able to attract funders, partners, and the like. And one of the things I did was I created a partnership with Facebook. Um, and Facebook in, in, invited us to participate in, as one of eight organizations around the world in its International Day of the Girl Child um, campaign, um, really looking to, to um, celebrate girls, providing them with opportunities, and or, you know, celebrating organizations that provide opportunities to girls. And what's important about this is that um, when I first started with the organization, and even up until the point, um, you know, the week uh, before the campaign, the organization had about 7,500 followers on its Facebook page. As a result of us participating in this campaign and, you know, really having the opportunity to partner with Facebook on a campaign on Facebook, we grew organically in one week to 175,000 uh, followers. And so that really was really incredible for us because all of a sudden we went from being a South Africa-based organization with outposts in the U.S. and the U.K. to being really, truly global brand and we're able to leverage that to fundraise online and to really get our message out there. So that was, again, thank you to this iSchool. Um, following that in 2017, um, I had an opportunity to go to, um, actually in 2016, I had an opportunity to go to the Con, um, Con, the Con Lions um, uh, International Festival of Creativity in France. Um, and I met with um, McCann World Group, which is like my number two um, ad agency in the world. I met with their uh, chief, um, I guess, creative officer. And I told him about our organization he loved and he said, we want to create a campaign for you. And so we partnered with them and we created the LinkedIn campaign. And basically what we did was the organization I work for works in South Africa with in very, very, very challenging environments and townships, which are known, you know, I guess you'd say that some of them are inner cities or they're really, really poor rural areas where kids really oftentimes don't have access to opportunities. That some of them are th seen as throwaway kids. And yet through the community centers that the organization organization I work for um, has developed from the time that kids are toddlers all the way into becoming young adults, they have access to a lot of really great opportunities to become leaders, to be able to really realize their potential. And so what I decided was really important about this was that we were going to celebrate these young people. So we, we found 12 of our young people in South Africa from the ages of 17, I'm sorry, 13 to 20. Um, and we created LinkedIn profiles for them. And we asked them, you know, um, to help us figure out like which, which leader do they want to become? And so we created these LinkedIn profiles with obviously their, their, their current title was student, but we, we decided that, it, that we wanted to show that they're aspiring to something greater. And so if you see this example, um, surprise, we made him indicate that he wanted to be the future NASA administrator at the time the NASA, NASA administrator was Charles Bolden. And so we created this whole profile for him. And interestingly enough, a bunch of former astronauts and NASA employees connected with him. But the purpose of this was to help people understand that these kids have, have potential that, that, you know, showing their, their projects that they're working on, what they're trying to uh, create in the world. And this has resulted in over half a million dollars raised for the organization. And so that campaign ran in 2017. 
All right, so now let me talk a little bit about my current story, but on the educator and speaker side. So I've been teaching for a very long time at New York University. Um, I teach in the currently in the um, Center for Global Affairs, and um, I and we have a fundraising program in which I teach. And my courses re are related to basically digital storytelling for nonprofits. This is when we had to go online in March, um, and so that was a fun transition. And for me, it was actually a very seamless transition because one, I do teach online and two I you know for whereas a lot of faculty really felt uncomfortable going online it was very seamless for me again with this back of the technology background in 2012, um, I had the opportunity to create a, a panel with um, Tia Rouge, who's one of my um, uh, collaborators, and our panel was on Africa Tech and women. And so this is just us at, at, you know, at South by Southwest, and we're able to really, actually this was a standing room only event, and we were able to really get, help people to understand all the technological developments in Africa and, and, and really kind of change the, the perspective on you know, what Afri bring, Africa brings to the table, particularly given that in Kenya, um, you've got M-Pesa mobile uh, payment platform, which is really the leader in mobile payments around the world. So that was a great opportunity. Fast forward to last summer, I went to Denmark with, a, with my speaking partner, and we um, trained a number of uh, nonprofit organizations um, around digital storytelling, how to, how to use human and digital strategies to access U.S. foundations. So that's an ex another example. And then just recently, last month, um, I um, created, a, I, I delivered a, yet another webinar for Candid, which is a leader in our space for sort of in, information exchange around the, the sector. And so this was on digital storytelling. We had 300 people who participate on this webinar uh, from all over the world. All right, now that you've gotten a sense for how I'm able to use my digital skills to um, really create an impact, I'm going to go into how you can create an impact with your digital skills. So this is what I'm assuming about you based on the information I received. You're either a prospective student or parent and you're considering the iSchool, or you're a current you know, student and you're thinking, okay, where, where am I going next? What should I be, what are some of the moves I should be making? Um, what should I be considering? And then you might be also an alum who's current, considering a career pivot it or as a result of whatever's been going on you you know you're forced to re-examine where you move forward um, or where you go for, from here on out and um, or you're a nonprofit professional who's really looking um, to create to have some kind of a digital boost so whether it's your skill sets or being able to bring digital engagement in within your organization so that's who I'm speaking to today I apologize if there's anyone else but that's really what my focus what's really important about this topic and why I chose to discuss this is because um, as you can imagine with you know the economic devastation that the pandemic has created um, you know organizations that are already on the you know on the verge of collapse or just really had um, you know who are constantly having having to raise funds, that kind of fundraising was, was definitely impacted. So a number of organizations raised their funds primarily through um, um, events. And, you know, as you can imagine, events were canceled. So if the majority of your budget is being raised through an event and it's canceled, that means that you're really, really going to be in a very, very ch challenging situation right now. And so um, really looking at how to bring digital to the forefront, how we can really get the, the sector to understand the importance of, you know, bringing your events virtually, right? You can, you know, you can deliver your events virtually. Um, you can actually deliver your services virtually in some instances um, and really kind of building your brand that way because, you know, in the past people could probably go and visit your, your um, organization and maybe learn about and meet your beneficiaries and so on and so forth. But in current state, that's not possible. That's not a possibility. And so um, that's why I really wanted to talk about that. And then I also consider the fact that, you know, this time that we've had these six months that people have had at home or, you know, they've really had an opportunity to reflect and not quite a number of people who I've been coaching and I've been speaking to, what they've say, been saying is like, you know, I have this great job or I had this great job, but I realized that I really want to make some kind of a difference with, you know, the skill set that I have or, you know, the, the experience and so on and so forth. And so that's really what, what, what brought about this topic. Uh, for those of you who are really not that familiar with the sector, I really want to show you the breadth of it um, in, 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 one, in one graphic. So let me go ahead and show you basically the business, business model spectrum uh, for social impact. 
So at the very, very, very left, you've got traditional nonprofits, right? So they're funded primarily by charitable giving. So whether it's grants or, you know, donations through Facebook or, you know, uh, individual gifts, um, that's really what, it, you know, that's the, the very end of it, which is what you're most likely to hear about. But then you've also got nonprofits that have earned income. So those might be organizations like Oxfam that has um, an arm that actually, you know, generates income that then goes into the nonprofit. So it's not only reliant on charitable giving, but it's also generating income. And this is really um, a push that I'm making for a lot of nonprofits right now is thinking about how you can create that secondary income stream or in another way to remain very, very viable. So for instance, if you think about, there's an organization called care.org. They are the originator of the care package, a huge, you know, $100 million nonprofit organization based of, out of Atlanta, but they have a global footprint. What they decided, and this was pre-COVID, but I thought was really smart, was they decided they really have great know-how in terms of how to work with corporates. They understand um, really how, they have certain skill sets around like crises and so on and so forth. And so they built a whole consulting arm that would go out into the market to sell those services either to nonprofits or to corporate social responsibility arms of corporations. So that's an example of nonprofit with earned income. And then in the middle, you've got a social enterprise. And so those are social businesses that, that you know, they're, 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 they are mission driven, you know, they, they are social impact driven, but financial return is part of the mix. And typically what happens with these in this bucket, they're reinvesting those profits into the community. So for instance, you've got like Greystone Bakery, which is out in the, in the, uh, on the West Coast, provides um, um, a, uh, job opportunities to formerly incarcerated people. Um, and it's a social enterprise that, you know, bakes, they, they, they bake things, right? So there's a bakery. And so they generate income through that. And then that, that money goes back into training and providing support to those people they're working with. And then you've got, um, on the, you know, after that, you've got a mission not driven, not for profit, which is a B Corp um, or, or B Corp. And basically that's a company that makes you know, it doesn't receive any kind of charitable giving and it, you know, it, and it makes money directly. But what it is, is that in order for it to qualify as a B Corp, it has to adhere to um, the triple bottom line. So it's got to show that it's creating impact for people, for pro um, uh, planet, and of course it's generating a profit. So that's what you've got there. And then to, uh, to the very right, you've got a corporate social responsibility or corporate philanthropy within a corporation. So um, it could be, uh, for instance, like, um, the, the Hilton Foundation is a the found is the corporate uh, giving arm of the Hilton Corporation, um, and so they they disperse grants um, widely. Um, and then you've got uh, on the very end purely you know profit driven corporation. So that's the full spectrum. Marta, I'm going to pause for a second and find out if there are any questions that are that have come in uh, before I continue. So far, no. So do okay. You Okay, and I just want to make sure that people are getting the PowerPoint presentation because I have um, their links to, you know, the, the, this section coming uh, from here on out has links to additional information that would be useful to everybody. All right, so let's talk about storytelling and digital storytelling. So story stories are really, really important because that's how we learn through them, right? You know, so when I was a little girl, I used to watch Sesame Street. I know younger people watch Dora the Explorer or, you know, they read the books um, and then you have Cinderella and, and, and the like. And so it, stories are very fundamental to who we are as people. So when we're, when we're organizations or even when we're as individuals trying to get jobs or if we're trying to attract funding and so on and so forth, we really need to understand how to tell a story. So I'm going to go ahead and give you um, a little bit about, you know, how stories really help in attracting funders. So um, stories can express what makes the nonprofit unique and worthy of attention and support, enables audiences to you know, identify with them, right? Because sometimes you, you're working in a situation like for instance, uh, Africa Tikkun, you know, we're working in an environment that's 10,000 miles away um, you know, in, in a township. People don't know what townships are here in New York City. So you've got to be able to create a story and, and, and a way for them to be able to relate to what you're doing so that it brings them in and, and it helps them 
to identify what, what you're doing. And then also it pro, you have to provide the case for the response you want, right? So are you looking for a grant? Do you want an online donation? Do you want them to uh, volunteer or sign a petition? So it's really important to, you know, kind of um, be clear about what you're trying to do in your story. So therefore, every nonprofit needs a well-crafted story. So let me go ahead and give you a basic storytelling framework. There, there are, you know, stories are a little bit more complex than this, but this is the, the easiest way for me to really short, sort of uh, share with you. So whether it is you're creating um, a, a social media post or you're applying for a grant or you're sending some kind of communication to a corporation or approaching an individual donor, you need to frame your story in this way. So there's some kind of, some kind of problem, right? You know, the, the problem talks about, you know, why you do what you do. So it's basically, this would really be related to like your mission. Like, you know, what is it that you were created to, to address? Um, and then you've got the solution is, and that's, that's, you know, what do you do and how do you do it? So like I said, with Africa Tikkun, we had community centers, we had a career to, cradle to career uh, develop, holistic development model through which we're able to help these young people to access their access opportunities and reach their potential. So that would be an example of the solution. And then the impact, and impact is really important because a lot of organizations speak about impact in terms of their results. Um, and that's one piece of it, but impact is really ultimately what are the implications of those results? So let's say you as an organization are um, maybe helping kids to access educational opportunities. Um, and so this year you were able to get 10,000 more kids to access education, but that's a, that's a result. But the implication or the impact of that is, you know, kids off the streets or more people, kids being able to reach their potential becoming productive citizens, being able to add to the tax base, and so on and so forth. So that's impact. And then finally, you want to make an ask. You always have to ask what it is that you need. So are you looking for funding? Uh, do you want someone to share your post? Um, you know, do you want them to like? And so on and so forth. So that's the basic storytelling framework. I'm not going to show you this video, but it's an excellent video and I've given you a link to watch it. It's from an organization called Charity Water, which is based right here near me. I'm, I'm in New York City in the financial district. This organization is based in Tribeca and um, it, it's, it's a phenomenal organization and the interesting thing is it's basically a marketing and fundraising organization and it partners with, with organizations around the world to deliver clean drinking water to um, communities that don't otherwise have it. So whether it's installing, um, you know, d digging wells or different kind of uh, water purification systems, that's what they do. And they've somehow convinced over 44,000 individuals to fundraise on their behalf. Are there anyone from a five-year-old who says, I'm giving my birthday or my, you know, piggy bank money to the organization to an 80-year-old saying, you know, I, I, I want to bring all my people to support this organization. So it's a really great organization to, to learn about, but more important, they do a really great job of telling stories and this is by far the best one I've seen and this video came out in 2011 and I've seen thousands of other videos but in terms of illustrating this point this is the best one I've seen thus far so some of the challenges that nonprofits have to overcome online now that we've talked about storytelling basics let's talk about digital you know there's a tremendous amount of fraud and even more so now that you know with covid there are a lot of um, sort of organizations that are popping up that are actually organizations or there are a lot of scammers out there so it's really important that organizations that nonprofits understand that that's the the space in which they're operating the other is that you know we always have a limited budget to execute but it's even more so the case now when I share a really important point with you. Um, it's been estimated that within the next 18 months, um, upwards of 40% of nonprofits in the US as well as worldwide are going to cease to exist. So this is a time where really coming, you know, understanding um, the strategies and the tactics that can make you give you that competitive advantage and help you to, to not only to survive, but to thrive is really, really important. The next thing is once you're online, you're, you have worldwide competition. So whereas in the past, if you're located in a small town, if you're lo located in Syracuse or whatever, you, your, your competitors, competitors would be around that physical space where you're located. But once you go online, you know, I as a donor, I as a potential, um, you know, volunteer have so many different options. So that's another challenge you have to, have to overcome. And then there's also the lack of visibility online. And I refer to those as limited digital footprints. So as a nonprofit, you definitely, you know, if, unless you're like UNICEF or you're, you know, United Way or organizations that just have a much larger footprints and so they, they can, um, 
people have multiple ways of finding them and they have the budget to be able to attract folks, you know, you're, 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 you're really going to have a challenge really um, uh, differentiating yourself and attracting the funding and the support that you want. And then, of course, when you're online, you're physically distant from the, the donor. So they don't even have the opportunity to meet you, to get to see how wonderful the, the, the environment you've created is, or to really meet the people that, you're, that you're, you're benefiting or the communities that you're serving. So that's another challenge that you have to overcome. And therefore, you have to, over, to overcome those challenges. Your organization must uh, remove fear through reassurance. And so I'm going to share this with you. Now, I have to tell you, this is the talk that I deliver like, you know, over several hours. So I'm just going to give you the highlights. I'm not going to go into the, the nitty gritty detail, but I'm going to give you links at the end so you can actually watch a webinar when I go into this much in much greater detail. But the key things you have to think about are you know, when you're online as you know, reassuring your audiences, you must be very transparent. And so transparency would refer to like, you know, having your financials, audited financials, veritably available on your website. Um, it's, you know, sharing any kind of, you know, sharing who's behind the organization. I can't tell you how many times I go to a website and I'm like, who are the people behind this? And you don't get to see them and I, or you don't have a way of reaching out to them. And that's really, really important when you're talking about funders, we're talking about people who want to support the work you're doing. So it's really important to do that. The other thing is authenticity. And what I mean by authenticity is that, you know, I can say a lot of great things about me, but what's more important is someone else talking about me, right? So that's sort of third party endorsement. So as an organization, it's very important for you to seek out any kind of um, sort of third party endorsement, whether it's having a blogger write about you or having your don't you know having a presence on your funders site um, and, and, and the like so that's a really important piece and then clarity when you're telling the story don't make it complicated um, I can't tell you how many organizations write pages and pages and pages and pages of, of content and no one has time for that quite pr primarily because first of all people are reading off of their their um, they're reading on their their phones and so you know you've got to get really really clear so it's very clear and it's got to be very 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 uh targeted so you know use i i encourage the use of videos of images and really limited um text if you can and then it's also really important and of course another example of that is using the storytelling framework and then be and then um uh, relevance relevance really speaks to if you've got you know, Google as your funder or partner, or you've got like, you know, your Gates Foundation um, grantee, you should list that because when someone's coming to your site, they want to see who, who is it that you're kind of, you know, who's, who's already, you know, supporting you, who, who is, you know, whose ecosystem are you part of? Because they want to see whether you're not, you're, you know, you're relate, you're, the people that support you are, 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 or the organizations that support you are similar to theirs. And so really, really important. That's one example of relevance. Another example of relevance is being able to, um, you know, really speak to the current issues. So two piece, two things that, that are really important right now for, for grant makers, for foundations is the focus on helping nonprofits that are not only been, they not only have been disrupted by the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but they're also do, creating services or have the ability to create services to address that, whether it's addressing populations that have been impacted or um, you know, providing different types of products and so on and so forth. So that's an example of relevance. So being able to demonstrate and to create things that are, are in line with that. And then another example of relevance is we've got this sort of social justice movement going on right now. And so quite a number of organizations, quite a number of funders have said, look, you know, we want to see that nonprofits and, you know, other social um, organizations are are either demonstrating that they've, they, they, they're inclusive in terms of their leadership, in terms of bringing in new voices to kind of, um, you know, uh, create services. So in the past, you know, it's the nonprofit or the funder that's determined what services are delivered. But quite frankly, if you're working with communities, the communities are, are in best position to tell you what they need. And so really creating that collaboration. So funders are looking for that. So that's again, an example of relevance. So this is a digital, this is your nonprofit's digital, ideal digital um, storytelling ecosystem. I won't go into it in great detail because I want to be mindful 
of timing, but you know, you know, so at the very center of it, you've got your nonprofit organizations. Oftentimes, what I found is you know, you spend so much time developing website, and in fact, with me, I'm currently on, in development of two websites for my my organization, so my my company. So I understand the the challenge. You go through so much; it requires a lot of effort, and so we feel like, okay, I've created it, so now people will come, right? If you build it, they will come. That's not how it works. It's very important to create all of these foot. I spoke about digital footprints before that point to your website and point to one another. So, for instance, you know, at this point, virtual events are really important. It's something that I added uh, to this ecosystem, you know, as a result of COVID. So organizations really need to think about, you know, whether it doesn't have to be a full fledged gala, but it could just be speaking engagements. You know, if you're if you're, for instance, working in the health space, um, you know, letting people learn, hear from your your researchers and what, what the kind of research they're doing. Doing. like bring bring the organization out through a virtual event very good way to get create that engagement um, another thing is to you know external partners like I mentioned before if you are a, a you know Ford Foundation funds you or whoever it is funds you you want to make sure that 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 you have a presence on their site maybe you're even listed in their annual report and so on and so forth and then then it points back to your website because again it create it adds to their credibility and then influencers so you've got media you've got even you know bloggers <laughs> um you've got um you've got um uh you know in social media influencers right so um are there any people that can you can really share your story and can point people to your website and talk about everything that you're doing really really important online so that they can bring their followings to their followers to support what you're doing um, and then, you know, email and mobile is another thing to think about email. Um, I always say to people, the, you know, the, the, the uh, signature of your email, you know, that section of your email is really, really important because that's where you can have links to your website. If you've got a campaign going on or anything that you want to promote, it's a really easy place to put because people are reading through your emails and at some point they're going to look at your, your, they're going to look at your signature. So it's a great place to showcase. And then mobile outreach is also important. So um, I recently wrote a piece about how um, nonprofits can leverage um, WhatsApp, the, the messaging app that's owned by Facebook, to not only engage with their supporters during COVID, but also to fundraise and so on and so forth, because there are a bunch of uh, new services that, that um, WhatsApp now offers for you to that facilitate doing so. Um, and of course, you want to be able to drive people back to your site. And then you've got peer to peer engagement platforms. So if you've ever had to sign a petition or anything like that uh, on behalf of an organization, you want to make sure that that petition then drives the person back to your website. And then you've got social media, which is obvious search engines. And then charity rating platforms are really important. So you've got GuideStar, you've got Charity Navigator. Uh, it's important to invest the time in building out those 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 um, those uh, profiles that you have on there because you know as a nonprofit if you have a 501c3 status if you have a, a nonprofit status they automatically generate um, um, some kind of um, a profile for you but you want to be able to take it over and really um, create create it the way you need because it's actually just it's even more important than your own website because it has greater traffic um, and so if a funder if a foundation is looking to figure out you know if you're compliant financially and so on and so forth they're going to go there first uh, and so it's important for you to be able to to, to invest in that Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some trends and opportunities. Um, so it's important to understand like there right now, there's so many things going on around the world, but specifically that apply to nonprofits that not actually need the skill set to be able to leverage. So one of which is artificial intelligence. So um, I recently read a piece about how um, you can actually now do, make a donation through Google. Um, so Google Assistant and so really understanding people who have the ability to understand how to to leverage artificial intelligence to not only raise funds but also to help deliver services so for instance um, there's an organization called the Trevor Project that is basically um, an organization that's set up to address LGBTQ youth who um, are suicidal and so they have like a they have a suicide um, line um, you know, like a, a hotline or, or call in line but what they've done is they they just received a grant from Google five million dollar grant to be able to add some AI in there so that that they can understand what some of the some of the key issues um, 
are that are coming through or the, the calls that are coming through so that they're able to um, have the computer, you know, the bots, the, the chat bots kind of address some of the issues at the beginning and then eventually go out to people. But so that's a thing to think about. Cryptocurrency is also very important. A lot of organizations haven't really taken great advantage of this, but um, really one great example is UNICEF. UNICEF has really been at the forefront and their, their innovation team is incredible. And what they recognize is that, say, if you're getting currency, if you're getting uh, donations in multiple currencies, oftentimes what happens is then you have to pay you know, you, you, there's a loss when you're converting from currency to another. When it's cryptocurrency, there isn't any conversion loss. Um, and then it also opens up opportunities for a lot of new funder, funding that you wouldn't have know, known about. So, um, so again, organizations need people who understand this and can support them around this. And then cybercrime, as I mentioned, you know, with the, with the pandemic, there's even greater crime going on. And so, you know, you're having, um, you know, in the same way that companies and hospitals and so on and so forth are, you know, are, are being um, attacked by these cyber criminals and even having their data held hostage, that's happening to nonprofits too. Um, and so it's a really, really important piece that certainly people coming out of this um, high school would understand how to address. Um, and then an interesting thing is that gaming, now gamers, people who, you know, I'm not a big gamer person. The last time I, I was a gamer was when I used to play Pac-Man when I was 10. But um, gamers have very big followings. And so some nonprofits have started to engage with them to have a gamer play. And then as they're playing, they have all these people viewing them. They can talk about the organization that they're sort of, you know, sort of playing on behalf and get people to donate and so on and so forth. So the folks who can actually create those partnerships and understand how to integrate all that are really, really valuable to nonprofits, really looking to um, expand the, the support base that they need. And then GDPR or General Data Protection Regulations came out of Europe. Um, and these are really, these are rules or regulations that govern how you use um, user data and how you kind of engage with people. So I won't go into great detail about it, but basically it's, if, if, if let's say, um, um, I give you, I sign up on your website and, um, and I say, yeah, I'm willing for you to write to me. And then all of a sudden, like you either give my email to someone else or use it for a different purpose in Europe right now that can generate millions of dollars in fines for a nonprofit organization or for any kind of organization. Um, and so it's really important to be mindful of how you use people's data, um, giving people the opportunity to be forgotten and so on and so forth. And so now what that's creating is organizations needing to create um, sort of data um, policies and, 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 and the like. And so um, GDPR right now is mainly in Europe, but it actually is now in California as well, and it's going to be rolling out in the US. So it's something to really think about. And then finally, and then um, next is messaging apps. As I mentioned, WhatsApp is an opportunity. Um, you've got messaging through Facebook messaging and, and other applications. So that's something to think about. And then virtual reality, if you can see me here, I was at a, as at a fundraising, um, large fundraising show, and um, virtual reality is really important piece particularly now given that people can't come to you um, and I and um, I had someone come into my my um, my course two years ago and he spoke about how uh, when someone learns about your organization or the experience your organization or whatever you're doing um, through virtual reality versus being in person they actually experience it on two different levels so it actually is embedded much more um, deeply for them. And so it really is very, very effective in converting. Now, in the past, the costs have been very significant, maybe like $150,000 to create a virtual reality video, but the cost has come down. And quite frankly, at this point, it's it's not a nice to have. It's really an important piece to be able to integrate. So folks who understand that, and I'm sure in high school people do, that's going to really be a very important opportunity. Um, job sources, let me just check my time. Job sources, we want to make sure that you're leveraging the iSchool and Sir General Syracuse University network. Really, really important. Um, I've got to tell you that you don't want to be a musician where you're blindly applying for a job, um, wherever you may be. Um, it's important that you really try to work relationships and work through the networks that you have access to. Um, I also say LinkedIn, and I'm giving you a screen grab of my LinkedIn profile, and I'm going to give you, uh, later on, you'll be able to link in with me. But LinkedIn is a very, very, very important part of your digital story as a, as a professional right now, um, more so than in the past, because one, you can't really see people. But this is, a, this is like your, this is really like your 
homepage, right? This is where you get to tell your story of the work that you're working on. You're able to share, like if you see here, um, I posted about, you know, speaking today and a lot of people who are really interested in it. In, front, in, front. in fact, one of my friends from high school saw it and she just signed up. Hi, Nana. Um, and so it's important to do that. Um, and then when I'm speaking and so on and so forth, I also um, um, am a LinkedIn, um, I guess, webcaster or podcaster, webcaster. And so um, I, I do LinkedIn webinars and that's also drawn a lot of opportunities to me because those are publicly available. So really figuring out how to create a very robust LinkedIn profile and then connecting you know, to folks through your Syracuse University uh, network and so on and so forth to really drive um, you know, opportunities to you. And then you've got social impact events. There are tons of events going on online, some of which are free. But you know, when you have a speaker who is literally just on Zoom with you, you have the opportunity to connect with them uh, and, and kind of say, I'd like to learn about your organization and, you know, this is what I bring to the table and so on and so forth versus in the past when you really didn't have that access. So I give you, I really encourage you to look at, you know, if it, whether it's nonprofits or foundations or social entrepreneurship events, you want to take advantage of those. Indeed is a website where you can get, you can access, you know, jobs in the traditional way. Uh, like I said, it's better to go through a network, but that is a resource. And then, of course, I know iSchool folks are very entrepreneurial. So obviously, <laughs> another source is to create your new venture and maybe building in some kind of impact element. Um, and so that's what I would encourage you to do. Some resources I put together for you. Uh, blog, I did a blog, wrote a blog post on, um, you know, how to digital storytelling to inspire and attract funders in time crisis. So that should be useful because you can, I'm, I go into greater detail than I was able to on this call or in this web webinar. Um, and then um, I wrote a blog post about four ways to boost your nonprofits, digital storytelling with WhatsApp. So I talked about that. Um, you have a link to my public speaking schedule. So if you want to attend one of my other events, you see them there. On my YouTube channel, I've done a lot of, a lot of all of the LinkedIn webinars that I, um, I deliver, I actually save them on my YouTube channel. So anything from funding uh, to just sort of personal branding and things like that, I've got really, really great resources for you. And then my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn, um, I'm always sharing resources, whether it's around funding or it's around, um, you know, job opportunities and the like. And then Twitter, um, I do the same. All right, get in touch with me. Um, you know, you can get on my website, you can email me, you can go on my website, um, as well as, you know, connect with me on social media. Uh, if you're interested in executive coaching and speaking, executive coaching service, happy to talk to you about that and how I help individuals to really get their story um, you know, to a point where they're able to attract new opportunities. And then I also do speaking engagements. Um, so if you're looking for a speaker, happy to come on board. And, um, and on my website, you'll see the different topics I cover. Um, and then through the Institute, I develop courses, and I deliver consulting. So we're currently, we're about to start a consulting um, um, opportunity with a university in um, South Africa around re their rebranding. Um, and then I also do training. All right, so let's go ahead and open up for questions. Thank you. Lynn. Should I stop sharing or do you want me to stay on here or what should I do? Yeah, stop sharing and then, okay. uh, so thank you very much for this uh, insights, Les. I was okay. particularly uh, uh, amazed as to the manner in which you told your own story as an example for people to tell their own stories when they start a conversation about themselves. But having said that, I want to not take any more time myself because we do have a few comments. So Nicole, do you want to ask Liz your question? Go ahead, unmute yourself. You're muted, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So, hi, my name is Nicole. I graduated from the Maxwell School in 2015, and I'm currently in my last semester um, doing the Information Management Master's program at the iSchool. So, just want to thank you for your commentary, and your work in South Africa really resonated with me because I'm the chair of the board of directors for a nonprofit that's based on the Eastern Cape. Oh, wow. And okay. We were, we were in Western, we had, a, we had a community center in Western Cape, in Fulani. Okay. Very yeah, cool. So, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
I definitely understand like what you were saying about the townships and trying to communicate the differences, obviously just like culturally and geographically and economically toward different audiences in the US um, and internationally. My question is around communicating student success stories. So just trying to understand or if you have any advice on balancing sharing individual student success stories versus like data-driven overall like performance outcomes of students. So um, last year we developed a mobile application that students can log on to and they input their grades, like their marks from each sure. quarter and then that, and their attendance like in our program and then that feeds into a Power BI dashboard and like workflow. Right. Um, so we're like starting that data collection process, but also just trying to understand a little bit more about like, how do you share like those actual numbers and student stories and balance not sharing individual stories so much that they have like this Western savior, like mentality or like focus when it's kind of like seen as an anomaly when students from the township go on to university. It, it, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. It makes a lot of sense to me. So first of all, I just want you to make a note of something when you're for your for your for this uh, uh, your data project. You might want to also look at co co contrast that with uh, the Soweto Cares database. That's it's Soweto Cares. Are you familiar with it? So that's data that's collected throughout the country um, around township um, education performance, like achievement. So you might be able to co compare and contrast. Just that that's in the side note. But um, beyond that, what I would say to you is that, yeah, there's some audiences that are going to want the data. They're going to want that in aggregate because you have to be able to show the scale, right, of your impact. Um, and so that's important. And I think, and I'm very much like, I love infographics. I don't, like I said, I, I'm not a lover of tons of text. Some people need that, but, you know, you want to be very succinct there. I also believe it's important to share the stories of individuals, but in a way that is is respectful of who they are, and it's not about like you know this kid you know um, who eats out of a garbage and you know they're you know the the kid with the snot and all that. No, that's very disempowering, and that's why if you noticed, I talked about that future leaders campaign that we created specifically because I wanted people to understand that this kid surprise is living in a township. This is his reality, but here's his report card. I didn't mention we had his report. Well, his report card like his drawings and things that he are interesting to him and he did a video he created a video so you can learn that you can get the human story behind that individual so they're no longer just one of 20,000 kids in the township it's this individual whose life you're potentially impacting through the work that you're doing so I think it is important to balance the you know balance the two um, and in a way that is is empowering and not disempowering to that individual thank you that, Liz and thank you Nicole for the question Thank you, Nicole, for the question. So um, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Carly, who has mentioned that she works for a, a Fortune 500 company, and she's doing plans around impact. And impact was, the way you describe it, was uh, quite useful for her, given that uh, impact in the business world is always around business uh, issues. But anyway, let me now give the opportunity to Carlos to ask his question. So go ahead, Carlos, unmute yourself. I can't see. Hi, thank you. Let me just okay. uh, put the video. Perfect. Hello. See you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been a very wonderful talk. I mean, it's like the first one. I actually had a uh, positive response to the ones that have been sent by Syracuse. So, thank you very much for the for the talk. Uh, thank you for joining fairly... us. I'm I'm, I'm honored mm -hmm. that it's the first one that you joined. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's more because of the type of job I do. I currently live in live and work in Costa Rica. I'm a, I'm a Maxwell grad from uh, 2008 okay. uh, from the master's degree program. And uh, I've been working in nonprofits and consultants since about the year 2000 when I came out of BA out here in where I am. And my question is the following. What, uh, because I... You mentioned a lot of tidbits of what should be part of your storytelling. I wanted to ask to you, for instance, uh, our organization, which I work with, it, which is a, we are sort of like an NGO, which works more like a consulting firm, but uh, has the ambitions of becoming a think tank because over the years we've accumulated a lot of expertise and a lot of work doing 
uh, work for U.S. government, Canadian government, and other donors. Uh, what is your opinion about podcasting, and how uh, is it worth it, and how do you try to get it worked in into your strategy if you want to do it? So podcasting as an audio or, or are you talking about video? I mean, because I know. Uh, I mean, I would like a, a comment on, I would like a, a comment on both because I mean, uh, I like podcasting, but I like it for my things. Like for instance, listening to sports, following some things on politics, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted just to hear your comment regarding that. So I think it all depends on the audience, right? So I think that like outside of the US, people tend to listen to radio. So podcasting, podcasts are very, very big. So I think that podcasting is good for that audience. But I think um, in more of the, in, in the US and you know, Western countries, I mean, in, in, in the global North, there tends to be an emphasis on video. So I feel like what I would do if I were you is I would record video and then pull out the audio for the podcast, right? So you do two for one. Um, but it's very important because those are assets that, you know, like if you think about it, like a TED, like a TED, you know, the TED Talks, those are huge assets, right? That you can then uh, monetize you know, uh, you know, in the future that you, you wouldn't as easily be able to monetize the podcast. So I would say that I would go ahead and go with the video and then pull out the audio. Um, in terms of frequency, um, it really depends on, on, again, the audience you're speaking to, um, the kind of the work you do. But I would say at the very least, you want to be doing this you know, maybe, maybe once or twice a month. Um, and then, you know, and, and you said that you have uh, quite you have basically um, a tremendous amount of content from the past. So I would even say bringing, you know, kind of commenting on some of the work that you worked on in the past that may be relevant today. So one of the things that I've been talking about is like, you know, with the nonprofits, when this whole, when the pandemic hit, I said, well, you know, when I was thinking about how to help nonprofits, I remembered back to 2009 when we had that global economic downturn, right? So this is not the first time we've been here, right? So what do we do then? What are some lessons we could apply from then that we could use now? So I, so I say that to say to you that there might be content you've generated, and I have no idea what the context is, but that might be relevant now. So you can always remix it. So you don't always have to create original or new content, but you can actually um, uh, repurpose what existing content you have. And, and, you know, so if it's written form, then you can, you know, um, uh, share it in, 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 in audio or in, and or video. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, does anybody have uh, one last question? We are like three minutes from uh, the end of this event. And I want to make sure that the audience has an opportunity to ask instead of me. And, and I don't know what, what, what timeline you guys are on, the, the iSchool folks, but I'm happy to stay on if anybody wants. Or um, again, I've given my contact details. So if you want to get in touch with me, please feel free. Uh, they do have the presentation, right, Marta? Okay, great. Uh, Adrian just sent it through the chat. So okay, thanks. Again, uh, hi, I just want to say hi to Heather. Heather's my friend from the high school, uh, and Nana, and of course Christine, who works with me, um, and my mom. My mom Hilda's on here too. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, uh, as uh, as Liz indicated, she will stay a little bit longer uh, for those of you who want to interact uh, a bit further with Liz. For those of you who have uh, other responsibilities to take care of, I do want to mention this is the first of our insights, uh, uh, iSchool Insights, and uh, we are planning for the next one around a career-related uh, issues and uh, hoping to uh, experiment a little bit with networking among those of you who will be attending. Um, so having said that, thank you everyone for attending and for those of you who are going to stay here. Um, I do have a question for Liz. And Liz, you have indicated that uh, the, um, uh, there are many technologies that we could be taking advantage of uh, to continue to tell our stories. And I was just wondering, because of course some of them are kind of expensive, and I was yep. wondering if you have come across some inexpensive new technologies along the ones that you have mentioned, like gaming or crypto or artificial intelligence that you have successfully seen deployed in any of the entities that you work with. I'm gonna tell you the thing that I'm telling everybody to do is LinkedIn. Because that's where the professionals are. So if you're looking for money, if you're looking for board members, if you're looking for, um, you know, if you're looking to 
build your thought leadership and gain that credibility, that is the number one platform that you need to be on. If you can't invest in anything else and, you know, and, 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 you know, you can have a free version, but if you get the upgraded version, which by the way, you can just try it for months to see what it's like. Um, it gives you an opportunity to, um, to really um, recruit board members if you're looking for board members. It gives you an opportunity to um, showcase the work you're talking about. So when Carlos was saying about, you know, um, you know whether they do a podcast or, um, you know, the, the sharing video or, or an audio, that's a great place to share that, right? Because it's there that people are there professionally, right? This, whereas on Facebook, it's different, but it's the place that you really want to be able to build that credibility. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to say that's really important that as an organization, everybody, all of your stakeholders should be connected to that page. So whether it's your staff, um, it's your, um, if you have beneficiaries, um, your board members, um, even funders, you want to make sure they're all connected because when someone goes to search you, so if a foundation or whoever goes to search you, then and they get to see, oh, you're you're connected to so and so. So I'll give you an example. Um, when um when when I was with Africa Tikkun, um, we were a member of WeWork, and WeWork has a, a, a social uh, networking platform that you can can engage with various members all over the world. And I looked for everybody with the word Africa in their profiles, and I found this one guy who had a company based in, in Midtown. I was interested in connecting with him, and I sent him a message, and then. Um, uh, he's like, sure, let me check it out. And then he happened to look on LinkedIn and he saw that on our LinkedIn page, my board chair was connected to it. And his board, my, my board chair and his, and my board chair's daughter and his daughter went to the same school. That resulted in a uh, significant donations from him and a partnership he helped us create with Delta um, Airlines. So really important. Thank really, you. I can't underscore how important that is. That is really helpful. I mean, especially because we're always thinking about the bells and whistles of innovation and sometimes at the most uh, affordable and easy accessible tools can be actually quite powerful so that's really nice absolutely uh, yeah yeah just run run to linkedin <laughs> <laughs> does anybody have uh, any other question by all means feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question to Lex. or of course you can always do it on the chat I'm trying, I'm also trying to see, like, the, because people wrote, and I, I'm trying to go through to see if there's anything someone asked. They, that they have, they're sharing their LinkedIn profile. That's what they're doing. Which is oh, they are. Well, um, so just connect with me. <laughs> if you connect with me, because I don't know how, if, I, if, I, if, if we can get access to the, the chat, if you can give it to me later, then I'll be able to connect there. But, um, okay, see the Glenn, Allen, please connect with me. I will, I will, I will add you on. I'm very good about that. Brianna, please go ahead. Um, and then, okay, so it looks like, okay, I think these people needed to leave early. So let me, let me, um, I'll, I'll connect with them afterwards. And so, Liz, um, just to share an update. Hi, everyone. This is Adrian from the iSchools Alumni Office. So um, we are going to send an email to everybody with the link to Liz's presentation, which um, will go out tomorrow. And I'll also um, be sure to link to Liz's LinkedIn profile. That way, if you would like to connect with her, um, I'll make it very easy for you. <laughs> awesome. And let me know what you're working on. Tell me your story. Yeah. <laughs> I challenge you to use the storytelling framework to tell your story or that of your and or your organization. Definitely. And um, you know, just a, a follow up too for that email that's going out tomorrow. If you have any topics you'd like to learn more about in the future or any feedback for us, please reply directly to that email um, and share your thoughts with us. We're always looking to improve and looking for content that our alumni and our students really want to learn more about. So please let us know. And Liz, I just want to say um, on behalf of the whole iSchool, thank you so much for hosting this. I think that uh, your content was so refreshing and uh, informative and I think that you know I personally got a lot of great ideas um, <laughs> thank you thank you it's, it's quite an honor I'm really excited the last time I spoke at the iSchool was in 2000 I think 11 or 12 no 12 
uh, during homecoming weekend. And so it's nice to be able to do this, um, you know, several years later um, in this context. And um, I'm really excited. I actually, when I was there that time, when we took that photograph um, that I showed with the It's School It Girls t-shirt, I said, wow, I wish the, the, the school looked like this when I was a student. I wanted, <laughs> I want all these cool technologies that they're, you know, involved in. And, and, and you know, there, there's such an emphasis on entrepreneurship and I'm very entrepreneurial. So I love that students have that access um, and, and it's really, you know, it's such a wonderful program. And I think that a lot of people, you know, they kind of think of when they think about technology, they think like computer science, which is one side of it. And I definitely wouldn't have been into that because I told you I hated programming and all that. But certainly this is this is a great program. Um, it's a, for you to be able to understand how to apply technology to address human challenges, right? And so whether it's on the business side of things or on the social side of things, it's really, really important. And, you know, and I graduated 20 years, 20 years more, you know, over 20 years ago when, you know, we weren't really, we were talking about technology as a side thing. Now it's integrated in everything we do. Right, and so it's such a great opportunity for alums, for students, prospective students who don't eventually do come into the iSchool to really uh, be able to have their impact felt or to create impact um, throughout society uh, by just simply using what they're taught in the school. So thank you. And I appreciate everyone joining us today because I'm sure you had other things you could have been doing, um, mm -hmm. but it's wonderful to have you and I'm glad that we had some people joining us from outside of the US as well. Uh, so one more opportunity for anyone to ask a question if you so wish. Okay, okay well, thank you again, Liz, for uh, your insights uh, and that uh, you are the inaugural speaker. We're looking forward to continue to working with you, me personally. Likewise. And, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Have a good rest of the afternoon and keep safe. Yeah, please keep safe everyone. Mm -hmm.